Good morning, everyone. I need to start by saying I have a financial conflict of interest with Cytodyne, the manufacturer of Loronimab. Uh, I'm quite excited to share this data with you today. This is the first time a lot of this is going to see the light of day. Uh, but I feel like this is a good, safe audience. And I think that these data will really uh, highlight well the interplay between our preclinical model of allogeneic stem cell transplantation uh, and the clinic. So as you just heard from Hans Peter, Timothy Brown is now 10 years out from HIV remission. However, we still do not know the mechanisms of this. And it's been postulated that it was due to his myeloblative chemotherapy, uh, the allo effect of the engrafting donor immune system, and perhaps the fact that he received a CCR5 deficient graft. Uh, we know through really elegant work from Guido Silvestri and Leslie Keane uh, in the non-human primate model that it was not the myeloblative chemotherapy. Uh, this was subsequently confirmed this year with the clinical study with the publication of the London patient. And so it really shows us that it is either this allo effect or the CCR5 deficient graft or some combination of the two. Now, despite these successes, it is still really difficult to do allogeneic stem cell transplantation in HIV people in the clinic. As indicated here by the first Dusseldorf patient who also received a CCR5 deficient graft, but after his treatment interruption, the virus just simply rebounded. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to use the power of the non-human primate model um, to really focus in on the mechanisms of HIV cure and allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So to this end, we focused on a population of animals called Mauritian cytomologous macaques. This is an insular population that descended from a, bo a bottleneck event about 500 years ago. Uh, we know through DNA mitochondrial analysis, it was as few as four males and one female on this island. Um, they then had a wonderful existence for about 500 years. There's now 70,000 of these animals. And because they went through that population bottleneck, uh, as done by Dave O'Connor about 10 years ago now, uh, he showed really well that there's only seven MHC haplotypes in this entire population. And so you can basically type 20 animals and easily find fully MHC matched donor recipient pairs. And sure enough, here you go. This is our first cohort that we did. You can see these animals are fully MHC matched. And so to set up a model of allogeneic stem cell transplantation, we wanted this to be as clinically relevant as possible. So we worked with the people who do bone marrow transplantations at OHSU in the hospital, and we copied everything they do. So we have an MHC matched donor that we mobilized for peripheral stem cell uh, donation by GCSF. We then do uh, an apheresis to collect stem cells. And you can see we've done many of these procedures. We've been very successful at it. In fact, because these animals can be as small as three kilograms, uh, the maker of the Optia has adopted parts of our uh, protocol for use in uh, pediatric apheresis. Uh, the recipient then undergoes reduced intensity conditioning. This again mimics what happens at the OHSU hospital. Uh, the recipient receives doses of stem cells and CD3 T cells that is on par with what they get in the clinic. And they undergo a short uh, immunosuppressive GVHD prophylactics regimen. And it turns out this is actually really a, a good model. It recapitulates many of the, of the facets that you see in humans in the clinic undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Now, from this publication, we have two animals that are now three years post-transplantation. And I want to take some time to walk you through these graphs because this is going to set the stage for the care part of the talk. So what we're looking at is donor chimeras in blood. So we're looking at the percent of the donor cells in blood on the y-axis versus days post-transplantation on the x. And these are the two phenotypic outcomes we see in these transplants. Uh, on top, you see this animal went very rapidly to 100% full donor chimerism and was stable thereafter. On the bottom, uh, you can see, and the way that we'll do this is the whole, and whole, just whole blood chimerism is shown in the colored graph. Um, and just like they do in the clinic, we monitor granulocytes, they're shown in the triangles, and CD3 T cells are shown in the squares. And this animal on the bottom, you can see, presented with mixed donor chimerism. So we, we performed a series of donor lymphocyte infusions, or DLIs, as indicated by the, the arrows. And you can see those are successful in getting this animal to 100%. Um, and as a, these animals, I said, are out three years. And what's great is that you can use this to study things that happen to people in the clinic. For example, it's known that individuals post-transplantation will experience metabolic disturbances and they gain significant weight. You can see in these two animals, following the years following the transplantation, they gained large amounts of weight and they're quite happy butterball animals now. Okay, so that was SIV naive. What about an SIV infection? So this is the plasma viral loads of our four stem cell transplant recipients over time. Uh, in the colored graphs, and then in black are their non-stem cell transplant time match controls. Um, and this is a, a protocol adopted from my colleagues Lewis Picker and Off McCoy, who showed very nicely. You can do an IV uh, low-dose MAC-239 infection. You initiate ART at day nine. This uh, results in a fully seeded reservoir that, is fully, uh, that always rebounds post-ART uh, release. Um, following 15 to 20 weeks of full ART suppression, these animals then undergo allogenic stem cell transplantation, as indicated by the dashed lines. And this is what it looks like. So looking at donor chimerism in these animals, 
Um, <clears throat> except what I've added on here is uh, a couple of populations that are going to be of, of note. Uh, CD4s and the purple blood are going to be in the circles, and lymph nodes we did bulk, which is the colored triangles, and then the lymph nodes, which are the open triangles. So you can see this animal required some DLIs to get to 100%, but did eventually get to uh, full um, engraftment. Um, this is reflected in the other two animals at the bottom. This animal in the bottom left is interesting. You'll see that transient drop in CD3 T cells. We thought that was rejection. It was actually post-transplant lipoproliferative disorder, or B cell lymphoma, which we were able to catch and successfully treat due to the great vet care that we have at ONPRC. Um, but what I really want to focus on is this animal. This is our rock star, Stormy. You can see she very rapidly, following a tapering of immunosuppression, just that gray box, uh, she very rapidly went to 100% donor in all of her compartments, CD4 in blood and CD4 in lymph node. And because this is a macaque model, you can do things you can't do in the clinic, like biopsy tissues that are usually unaccessible. So here's an example. We biopsied lymph node at 309 days post-transplantation. And you're looking at uh, subset donor chimerism in the top and all these various immune compartments uh, in the blood, and then also in the lymph node in the bottom. And what I'll point out to you in the bottom is in the CD4 T cells, the TFH, of, of a known viral sanctuary site, is 100% derived from donor, meaning that we had a really good shot at fully wiping out the reservoir in this animal. Um, okay, so what does this do to the reservoir? So to frame this, I'm going to show you again this first animal, this time looking at only the donor chimerism in the T cells in the blood, and again looking at the CD4s in PBMC and lymph node the triangles. You can see in this animal, uh, she required DLIs to go to full donor uh, chimerism. What does this do to the reservoir? So this is going to be in the colored lines, CD4s are circles, lymph node CD4s are going to be in the triangles. Post-transplantation, you don't see a cure. You see about a log drop in the viral reservoir. Um, again, this indicates that it's not the vital, but it's not the conditioning regimen. But what you see is that as you start to see engraftment in a certain compartment, the reservoir drops, indicating this is associated with that allo effect that's, that's purging the reservoir. And you can see this in these two animals here. Uh, we don't quite have them uh, latest data after they've gone to 100%, but we have that in Stormy. And as you can see, in Stormy, again, you see about uh, log reduction post the, re the conditioning, but as you get in graft and whole blood, virus disappears, you can't find it anymore. As the CD4s and lymph node get replaced by donor, you can't find the virus anymore, it simply goes away. And we can't find virus in any of these tissues. Again, because this is a non-human primate, you can biopsy things that you can't do in humans. Um, so this is a biopsy from 519 days post-transplantation. Uh, we looked in peripheral lymph nodes, uh, the bone marrow, and through a great technique that my colleague Dr. Uh, Jeremy Smedley will tell you about, you can biopsy mesenteric lymph nodes in the spleen. And all those biopsies, we found one copy, one, in the mesenteric lymph node, which we would have missed if it went out for that technique. Um, so we did also adoptively transfer these mesenteric lymph node spleen samples to a naive animal. Virus did not pop up. Um, so what I suspect is that we reduced the reservoir really, really well. But Stormy's going to look like a Boston patient because she received a CCR5 sufficient graft. Now remember, in this mesenteric lymph node, all of those cells are derived by donor. So that virus is sitting in a donor cell, which probably means that what happens is the, is the allo effect that probably is responsible for clearing most of the reservoir. But you need that CCR5 deficiency to protect those cells as they're from the donor as they're in very close contact with the recipient they clear it out. Um, and so that's something that needs to be tested. So how do you test a CCR5 deficiency? Well, we took an alternate tack and we turned to something called the uh, Many of you may have known this from its former life, which is Pro140. This is a human, uh, humanized IgG4 antibody that's specific for CCR5. It binds the extracellular domain 2 of CCR5, which is where HIV envelope binds. And so it inhibits by a competitive mechanism. <clears throat> uh, this has been in over 600 patients and is in phase three clinical trials now. Um, as you can see here, the previously published study of a single dose of lorandamab in untreated uh, HIV patients, you get about a log and a half reduction with a single dose of lorandamab indicating that it can be quite potent um, in vivo. So our hypothesis was, well, maybe we can use this compound to fully mask CCR5 in these animals or in a person to where you don't even need to actually knock out CCR5. You can just phenocopy it by having antibodies sitting on that site. And so we went after this first in vitro. This is uh, activated human CD4 T cells. On the top row, this is from someone who's CCR5 wild type. And you can easily infect those CD4s with an X4R5 trophic virus that same donor and you pre-treat it with concentrations of loralimab in vitro that you can achieve in vivo, and you can see you fully can block an R5 trophic virus. Can't touch X4, which makes sense. 
um, but you can fully block <coughs> excuse me, R5. And that really looks exactly like what you see with someone who sees CR5 delta 32 homozygous, which is the bottom row. We repeated this with a panel of 10 X4 tropic viruses shown in blue, um, 10 R5 viruses shown in red. And in the middle row, this is someone that was we had pre-treatment with around the map. And you can see that that pretty much looks exactly like the graph on the right, which is from a CCR5 delta 32 homozygous. So at least in vitro, this hypothesis seems to hold. Uh, what about in vivo? <coughs> Excuse me. So for this, we selected SHIV SF162P3 for two reasons. One, when lorolumab was first isolated, it was known that the envelope from SF162P3, for whatever reason, was about tenfold more resistant to neutralization than any other HIV isolate. No idea why, but it just is. So we thought this would be a higher bar for this in vivo. Secondly, uh, this virus has been, the mechanisms have been defined by which it, it shifts tropism from R5 to X4. So that's why we selected this virus. So here at three control macaques, you can see we IV infected them. They have very high viral loads throughout. Um, that's in contrast to the four animals that we treated with uh, weekly subcutaneous injections of lorandamab. Uh, you can get a slow decay of virus, um, but it does work. You can see that at the end of the treatment, there were two animals that reached fully undetectable viremia. This is, works out to about a 10,000-fold reduction in, in viral loads in the plasma, so it seems to be quite effective. If you look at the change in the CCR5 positive CD4 T cells in these animals, um, the untreated animals, you see a massive depletion that's sustained throughout. In contrast, as soon as you treat with lorandamab, you see a rebound and repopulation of the R5 expressing cells, so this does seem to work. Uh, looking at receptor occupancy on necropsy, uh, what you're looking at for all these tissues <coughs> is in red is a staining with a, a different R5 tropic, sorry, CCR5 antibody that stains a distinct epitope. Blue is anti-human IgG4, anti lorandamab and then orange is the costain. If you look at any tissue, for example, the blood on the left, there's no difference. That's 100% receptor occupancy. Um, we see this across all the tissues. The only place we don't see it is on these graphs on the right, uh, the cerebellum and the frontal and parietal lobe. That makes sense because of the antibody can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And so any marking that we get is probably CD4 T cells that have gone across the barrier. <coughs> So it's been known for quite some time that individuals who are CCR5 delta 32 homozygous are very highly resistant, if not fully resistant, to acquisition through mucosal sexual transmission. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that it's almost always an R5 tropic virus that crosses uh, the mucosa, as uh, has been shown really elegantly by Brandon Keel and others. Um, and so to really ask the question, could this really work for our stem cell transplant, could we really copy this? We thought the best way to determine if around the lab could, could copy a CCR5 deficient phenotype is doing a PrEP study. So we took uh, three groups of animals, controls. One group received lorandamab at the higher dose every two weeks, and one group received the 10 meg per kg every week. This is the dose that's in clinical trials right now. And then we did low dose SHIV SF162 P3 challenge at interrectal. And this is very much a work in progress, but I wanted to show it because I, I think it's quite exciting. What you can see is that we don't have all the animals through this yet. Uh, we only have four lorandamab treated animals. Uh, versus five controls, but the long and short of it is that if you look after eight low-dose weekly SHIV SF162P3 challenges shown by those red arrows, all of the controls get infected and zero of the lorandamab treated animals get infected. So yes, we need to repeat this and we're going to, but I want to show this because it shows that there is some validity to this, that simply treating with this antibody can mimic a CCR5 deficient phenotype. These are the survival curves. Um, again, very much a work in progress, but does make the point, I think, quite nicely. Um, so now with this model, uh, we can do, uh, we can test the ability of this aloe effect, and we can test the ability of a, a CCR5 deficient graft. So in closing, um, what are the strengths of this Mauritian cinemologist macaque model? Well, we can use it to really look at the, the mechanism of how allogeneic stem cell transplantation can functionally cure people. Um, as Hans Peter said, this is never going to get rolled out as, as a cure, but it will help us zero in on the mechanism and help inform future therapeutics. Um, I think a good way to, to, one exciting thing about this is that this is an example of the non-human primate contributing to uh, potential human studies, and that is that you could simply take an HIV person that's undergoing stem cell transplantation for, for lymphoma. Um, if there's no R5 deficient donor, uh, available, you can still take a, sh a shot at cure by simply adding in lorandamab once weekly sub-Q during the peritransplant period. Lorandamab is already in clinical trials for GVHD prophylaxis. It's already being given to stem cell transplant recipients during this time. 
So it's not any stretch of the imagination to think that you could add this on as adjunctive therapy to take a shot at a cure. Um, finally, the Mauritian cinemologus macaque turns out to be really good a uh, mirror of the human condition for a lot of things. As I showed you, post-transplantation, you have a metabolic dysfunction. These animals gain a lot of weight. Um, one of them was really pale. Following transplantation, she was completely brown. She looked like a different monkey. This happens to people, too. Following transplantation, their gray hair turns back into brown. There's hope for me. <laughs> um, we're also testing, I didn't show, talk about any of this, but uh, this was touched on by a question by Jason. Opportunistic infections are horrendous. Um, major cause of morbidity and mortality. Oh, I just got the three-minute warning. Perfect. Um, major cause of morbidity and mortality, but um, we can study this in these animals, and it, we've actually uh, been testing some novel treatments for these. We're also testing uh, conditioning and anti-GVHD regimens. And as I alluded to very shortly, these animals are really sensitive to, to PTLD or uh, B-cell lymphomas post-transplantation. It's the number one uh, problem we encounter post-transplantation. Um, and this is also in the clinic a major problem. There's no good models of it, so it turns out Mauritian Sinos might be a great model for PTLD. Um, and so we really need more Mauritian Sinos. So with that, I'll thank the individuals who did this work. Uh, mostly that's uh, Helen Wu and Shalon Shang in my lab. Um, and I want to thank the animal care staff, uh, my colleague Jeremy Smedley, and also the vets at ONPRC for caring for these animals, because this is not an easy project. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jenna. We have a couple minutes. Questions? Oh, Lewis is getting up. You gonna ask me a question? No. Richard Sanders from NIAID. Um, could the um, Leronimab treatment potentially be combined with what Jason Frenchley presented yesterday with the PET3 knockout? Because that's, I can see a synergy between the two treatments. Absolutely. So when we first went down this pathway, we actually wanted to use ibalizumab, the CD4 blocking antibody. Um, but it turns out that when you put that antibody into a non-human primate, it's incredibly immunogenic and it's cleared by ADAs really rapidly. Um, Loronimab, for whatever reason, is, doesn't seem to be as immunogenic. But yeah, I completely agree. Combination, immuno, combination therapy is where it's at. So CD4 plus CDFI is uh, down-regulation. It would be really hard for the virus to mutate away from that. Okay, you're right. Um, when we did apheresis on the animals, we had to prime the system with 10 mils of blood from a multiple different number of animals. So does that mean you're going to get a major aloe response in the T cells? You do if you don't leukoreduce. So we ABO match uh, the, the donors, but then we leukoreduce. And so it's just RBCs and plasma that goes in, and you, and you don't get any immune activation. So you have no, no leukocytes at all in that? No, it's a remarkable filter. Okay. But that's the lines that we need to write this Mark, we need to do that. And we found that out because initially uh, Lewis wanted Luco to do ICS. We found if we did Luco reduce, you'd get just random activation. And so we had that's how we solved that problem. I can give you the filter one, information. One, one. Are, are there anatomical sites where you don't get 100% chimerism? So, um, so far, no. Interesting though, the spleen seemed to be the one that lagged behind the most. But when she hit 100%, at one point in spleen, she was like 60%. So spleen really lagged behind. And I think it really underscores the need to look in tissue and, and at sites that you would normally never think of. I mean, I didn't realize you could biopsy the spleen until Jeremy told us we could do it. In liver? Sorry? In liver? Liver's tough because you have to, you can only get small biopsies and you have to treat it and you get a very few number of cells out and you can do bulk CD45, which is what we do for the colon, um, but we haven't done it yet for liver. Okay. 